Okay, LEPC meeting for 102518. Um, the chair declares that we have a quorum here at 938 in the morning. And we're going to open up and deal with our agenda items. First item of business is the acceptance of the Thursday, September 28, 2018 minutes. So if there's anybody here that was uh, sworn members in attendance, they can vote on those minutes. So moved. I have a motion made by Randy. Second. Second by Tom. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I mean, the first item is done. Next item is new business, and we have with us today <coughs> Bruce Augusti from MEMA, Area 3 and 4. Yes, sir. Right? And uh, Bruce has been a uh, resource person along with Charlie for this committee for many years. Um, I'm not sure. Do you know everybody here? Um, I think I do. Uh, if we haven't, hello. We got um, Mark Siegel. Uh, yeah. Kirk Sanders is out on the lead. Okay. And then Deputy Fire Chief Richard Stefanovich. Mr. Augusti. We met a long time ago. Yes, we did. Okay. We you did. know everybody else here? Different, I think I do. Different departments. Good. Uh, we are trying to. Uh, <coughs> I think I'd spoken to Kirk about trying to find another business and industry rep because Brian Houlihan from the American Inn, um, who no longer has that position, and Brian has a similar job in, in somewhere in Westfield now. So we do need to find another person that falls under that category. Business and industry? Business and industry rep. Yeah, there's different categories under an LEPC program in Kirk. And I think Kirk was going to reach out and talk to the person who took over for Brian up there. If not, we can obviously identify somebody in another... What's uh, Brian's last name? Houlihan. Houlihan. Right, so we really should know, if, you know, trying to secure another person that falls under that category, So because we essentially have all the other categories with all of you here. The few that are uh, not in attendance today. Right, I'll check with them. All right, thank you. Bye. All right, so uh, Bruce, you were going to, uh, to give sure. an update I'll what's be, going I'm, on in the Commonwealth. I, I will, and I'm looking real quickly. Um, yesterday, the Tuesday, I'm sorry, Tuesday, there was a tornado in, in the town of Norton. It was an EF1, and James Mannion, the regional manager, sent me a couple of pictures I was going to share with you, and I may have accidentally deleted them um, 95 to 100 miles an hour uh, no uh, no damage to to um, any major businesses a couple of homes had roofs torn off and a couple of garages were damages no deaths but um, it was pretty scary Tuesday afternoon if you if you kind of looked out in the sky and that's uh, that's how quickly it and happens. It developed east of, and, east of Springfield. Yeah, and it just seems like it. It doesn't matter what time of the year. I remember three years ago, we had two years ago, we had one in February, um, up in up in Franklin County, up in the town of Conway, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's not supposed to happen. No, but it does. Rare. Okay, um, the. That's what's happening as far as major weather events. We're supposed to get maybe one to two inches of rain over the weekend. Uh, they said Saturday and Sunday. National Weather this morning sent us a, a little blurb saying it might all get out of here by Saturday afternoon. But there's still going to be an inch to an inch and a half of rain. So uh, that's what we call a rain nor'easter. Doesn't always have to be. Doesn't always have to be in the white. Uh, a powder form. Oh yeah. Um, one of the other things that we're doing at, at NEMA now is we're going through some of all of the old um, reimbursement records um, and if you would, um, we're, they have found some payments that were never made to cities and towns from 2011. And that would be Tropical Storm Irene. Money got hung up with FEMA somewhere, and now, believe it or not, it's just trickling down. I got two phone calls this morning. There's two towns in this region that are getting over $5,200 in money that's owed to them. So it would be August. So this, was this a declared county? 
Yes, so that's Hampton, yes. Hampton County yes. declared. So it would be August of 2011, Tropical hmm. Storm Irene. See if you were ever reimbursed, if you ever submitted damages to it. Um, um, yeah, we Charlie, can, well, yeah. you'll have to check the scene. Yeah, it, you maybe records. were, but like I said, there was a couple, and all of a sudden it's seven years later, and, <laughs> and people are having uh, monies found for them. Yeah. Does that, well, mean, that, does that mean there still can be outstanding monies for like that October storm, too? Yeah, it's very possible. Mm, okay. We pretty much. Covered that? Yeah, I mean, we that was a whole, whole. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we hired one of those uh, third party companies through the. Um, the state DEP bid and uh, for debris management, and we went through all sorts. We have crates and crates of records. DPW had to babysit, uh, you know, those vendors to make sure that they weren't, um, you know, overcharging us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we had our own vendors, and we did not, because we didn't wait for the state. We, you know, and we didn't yeah, wait for the Kerry state Greenfield. bidder even. We went and used our local people. Yeah, and Kerry Greenfield started. And yep, and then some of those we ended up getting, uh, you know, some of the costs were disallowed, but it was just one of those things where we went ahead and did it. But we we pretty much, you know, went through the process and, and went through um, some uh, post-storm auditing and stuff like that. So we pretty feel pretty comfortable that we recovered a lot of our funds. Of, you know, it was an interesting thing. We had gone to town meeting. It was a fairly large town meeting. It was, and um, you know, for some other issues. And one of the things was the storm recovery money we needed to do. And it only passed by one or two votes that people were going to give us the money to pay the bills to front it. Because you essentially have to front the money. Because Mima, and he'll tell you, Mima, Fema, that that's going to come later. And you never know how much of a percentage you're going to get and what's eligible and what's not. So that was quite a, a, a process of going so. through that. Yeah. But, you know, a, a, a good few, I mean, so, uh, half of us maybe were in the room, you know, during that storm here, during post-cleanup. <laughs> you know, you were probably out were you out in the field. Yeah. Well, we had, we had Wamiko, which is now Eversource. Yeah. Had their, um, you know, their emergency operations center in Southwick was right outside the door here in another part yeah. of this building. And Remember those guys were set up, I think, at the Big E, uh, sleeping overnight and stuff. Yeah, the really crews. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, crews. It's just like they all have reciprocity agreements and they all go over the country with each other. So, yeah. But uh, we're pretty confident that we recovered all of those dollars. Gotcha. So this is small dollars, but it's worth mm. checking out. Yeah. So that's that's getting into that, and obviously the biggest question that's going on now is what's happening in Lawrence and and in uh, Andover and in <coughs> North Andover, and it's probably the biggest event we'll ever see in the state of Massachusetts. A few years ago, we had one in South Hadley, which they claimed in October, um, just before. Um, Halloween that they claimed was the biggest in the state and then Danvers had one the day before Thanksgiving which that was a chemical explosion yeah yeah, yeah. The this was gas yeah okay well this would be a hazmat <laughs> there's no question and um, uh, basically what we're finding out there's a lot of things we can't talk about obviously because uh, uh, it's litigation mm -hmm. well there's, it's all yes. being it, it's investigation or litigation. It is, it is, and it's still going to be another two years before they really get the the bottom line answer. <clears throat> but apparently, what was what happened was there was some pipes, gas mains that were being repaired, and they used this like a cylinder ball that they run through to test to be sure that there's that there's no leaks um, and that everything is copacetic inside. And apparently, that little silver ball... The pig, right? They call it the pig. Yeah. ...was never removed. So... Oops. I it built the pressure up to 12 times what the line is supposed to hold. Out. Usually 0. 0.6 is an average hole. And when they started shooting the pressure, 
in, in some places it got up to 50 pounds is why some of the homes and stuff were actually blown off of their foundations and stuff. So, um, is that because when it starts reading it, it starts, it keeps it keeps getting a message back that it's right. not, it's not, it's not, yeah, it's not they, getting enough gas, not, so they keep putting pressure, more in. Not pressurized. Right. And they said shoot a little more, and I'm pressurized. So I just, you know, I just came coming and stuff, and, and it almost happened again. Mm. So that's what I heard, right? Yeah. How many homes were affected? Oh God. Let's put it this way: There's 8,300 people that that are um, not living a normal life, and and what's what's actually homes are 8,300 residences or 8,300 homes. 8,300 residences. Residents. Okay, okay, that's many more people. Okay, so they can be obviously three cities: Andover, the North Andover are. Um, yep. Lawrence and our our what we would consider um, middle class upper middle class clientele. Uh, it's my understanding that the city of Lawrence has a population of of seventy five to seventy six percent a minority population. So they may be living in three or four family homes um, and. Um, their situation is obviously different than uh, than it would be in Andover and, and, and North Andover. But, I mean, they suffered, let's face it, they suffered the same type of inconvenience and losses as, as, as everyone else. Um, but what's going on now is Columbia Gas is giving heaters for heat and space heaters uh, and plates to, to cook on to for as many people as can get back into their home without natural gas as possible. Um, but they're finding um, in some areas that it's not safe to use these space heaters because some of the wiring and stuff might sure not really be up to where it should be. Problematic. Uh, we're going to have electrical fires and stuff. Thank you. So now they've had to go ahead and hire out a police officer, a firefighter, a technician from Columbia or one of the other natural gas companies, an inspector to go around to each one of these homes to be sure that everything is safe. Police officer, if you're not home, to gain entry. Firefighter to check to see that there's no fires. And an inspector to say, okay, you can go ahead and do that. So you're looking at four to five man teams visiting all the homes that they are trying to prepare to get ready. But that's just to put the temporary measure in. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> and that's not the final inspection. So you can imagine what that cost is going to be. The next thing is they're on the hook for new furnaces, new water heaters, ranges, stoves, um, and whatever other appliances were dryers. Are those okay. what, all gas appliances? Could be gas dryers if you had a gas dryer. And uh, I mean, you're probably looking at $15,000 a home. And uh, <laughs> that's enormous. So I don't know what the bottom line is going to be, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be in the millions upon millions of dollars. And, and luckily, and, it, and it's very sad, there was one young, right. one young man that's who amazing. did die, yeah, but amazing. there was only one death. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's and, amazing. Yeah, you yeah, can replace... Yeah. You can re houses blowing up and there was people weren't in them. Well, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. Those were fatalities. Well, same thing that happened in, yeah. happened they in Springfield. Yeah. Yeah. You were in a driveway uh, waiting for your yep. buddy to come out of yep. the house and the chimney's blowing yeah, that was it. And that was the one that was the one fatality, right? Teenager. And natural gas is so powerful. I mean, it actually blew a couple of homes right off their foundation. So that was... That was not. That was not good. Uh, well, well no fear of that. We have what uh, half propane, Charlie, and half small retail lines. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's kind of where they are, broad stroke and stuff. And they're hoping to get back by November nineteenth. And there's a lot of people that are saying it just can't be done by that. And um, Wait, winter comes, then the reality. And in, and in the meantime, these people are, who have been displaced, and, and one of the questions that everybody's calling up and saying is, well, how many people are in how many shelters every day, and how many people are being fed? And again, we go back to, 
there are many, many people who are living with brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, fathers and mothers uh, in surrounding towns and are able to, to go ahead and, and, and find inexpensive ways to live. There are other people who are staying in hotels or motels that Columbia Gas has to pay for plus their meals. Um, and then FEMA sent down several hundred trailers like they did um, during the um, during, during the flooding in the south several years ago when they, when they had the Houston Astrodome. There's a couple hundred trailers that are parked out that people are living in now. So, um, Are those the ones with the formaldehyde in them? Well, no, we had, <laughs> we had, it, we had to get rid of those. And, uh, but the same type of a, a setup and... Um, uh, yeah, it's just, I guess we don't know how lucky we all are at times. I'm just thinking, you know, so when you get, you, you go into the winter, you know, you can shut your plumbing off and you're not going to, if there's no heat, but then just the damage that a winter does to structures mm. over the course of several months that yeah. if they can't be occupied, mm. there's going to be a lot of damage just on... The water freezing water. Yeah. 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 Well, that's why yeah, everything, you shut that off, got to be shut it. down and okay. stuff and... Um, yeah, but the fact of having no heat in a structure, sometimes after mold. a while, the paint starts oh, yeah. to crack. The yeah. stuff yeah. actually, mm -hmm. get, wallpaper, you get mold issues. cabinets yeah. crack, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another, that's another back-end thing they're going to have to look at because I'm sure somewhere along the line, yes. despite all of this, somebody is going to be able to create some disaster that was not, okay, that was not a direct result of, of this incident. And... A guy puts in a claim for ten thousand dollars more, just as you said. With mm -hmm. geez, my my ceramic tile cracked in my bathroom because it got so cold, or mm -hmm. whatever it is. You're into this for a couple of billion. Is it fraud? Is it whatever? Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? You're probably just gonna pay the guy to make him go away or something. But well, they'll bring in know. one of those what are called special masters, like yeah. Ken Feinberg yeah. did, and they just quantify your loss. This yeah. is your loss. Yeah. This is the category you fall in, yeah. and that's all you get. Absolutely, and that's the only way that's I think it can be done. Thing. Right, they, because it's you know they just bring in a special yeah. master, and uh, we'll we'll have to see what the, what the end result is. But they're saying. It's, it probably could be two years out before it's really finalized on, 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 on NTSB. It, what's happened, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we'll see what we'll see what how that comes. Um, getting back to a local level, like we talked Friday. One of the one of the things that FEMA is now looking at is and and they're hot on this simply because of all the disasters that are happening around the country. Is a, is a program called PODS, or we because the whole world is made up of acronyms, and we call it a POD program. We talked about this, didn't we? And, um, a POD pro, maybe we didn't. I've talked to so many. No, we were no, we, we, we were talking about other. We were just talking about the grant sign-offs and okay. some of that stuff. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and just before I get into the POD program, um, you folks are eligible for about three or four thousand dollars in two different grants. Uh, that Charlie wrote and qualified for, and, and Carl signed. Are those off mostly on SEMA related? Uh, um, those equipment. are the, the, yeah. That's a, that's equipment for for your EOC and for yeah. some training that you have up until June to do to do a tabletop drill and stuff that that the feds will pay for and get you recertif yeah. keep you recertified. Well, that the, helps. That helps pay. Right, Charlie. That last one for, through the fire chief. It helped pay. The deputy fire chief from um, Sandwich came up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, J.J. Mm -hmm. Burke. Right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that that helped pay for them. Yeah. That that it one paid for it all. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and it was um, it was very enlightening. And, and oh yeah, that was that was and, a good yeah, good and, training. And chief and chief Burke is a is good sort. Of, he's a Hoyoke native and, and uh, oh, loves to come back. That. He grew up went to Hoyoke High School. Uh, went to school. That's that's why he came to Western Mass. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, it's a long ride from the Cape. Yeah. But he doesn't. He comes out periodically um, to help everybody in Western Mass who has a request. He does. He just did two up in Pittsfield and Lenox, uh, and Hoyoke. He's done one. He's done several in Hoyoke because obviously that's where that's where he's from. Um, yeah, and it is nice to see him come back and and help out the, uh, uh, the people that he grew up with and stuff. And he is a he is an excellent uh, knowledge base. Um, but anyway, getting back to this thing that's called pods. Okay, what is a pod? Okay, a pod is a point of distribution 
and it's a system that FEMA has discovered. So they um, affectionately call it a pods. Okay. Well, okay. What Not we... to be confused with the Department of Public Health. Right. Point call, of we call dispensary. Points, so we call them points of distribution as well. We call yeah. them pods the same. Uh, yeah. Ours, ours would be a little. Yes, they are. Ours would be a little different, and. In the springtime, and hopefully we'll be able to do something in the summer, okay, FEMA is going to come out based on all the towns that we suggest, select, or group, and take a look at three or four of them that are going to be the best possible sites to actually put, um, we'll call it a full-scale drill or exercise, okay, but actually I want to call it a full-scale demonstration. Um, to show how effective it can be if a community or neighboring communities are impacted by a major disaster. So what FEMA is going to do once the sites are selected, they are going to roll in trailer trucks of blankets, of pillows, another trailer trucks are going to have uh, uh, trailer trucks loaded with bottles and gallons of water. They'll all be palletized, okay? And the other thing they're going to have is is called uh, MREs, uh, meals oh. ready to eat. Oh. Uh, just, uh, okay. You ever try one of them? Yeah. Just, oh, yeah. TJ carb. eats those for yeah. dinner, yeah. I think. Just, well, I've tried them. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah, make sure you have a nice garden <laughs> if you can't get to the supermarket. So they're bringing all this stuff up? Right, and they're actually, what they're going to do... How, how, are they, these... how are they going to have time to do this? They're going to be needing that stuff to respond to all the other emergencies throughout the rest of the United States that happen every day. Yeah, well, what they're going to do is they, they, ha they have a select group of people that they use. Um, it's the same way they, if, if we thought we were going to have a tornado or if there was going to be a hurricane, um, Westover... Um, Barnes and a couple other um, air bases um, mm -hmm. actually have trailer trucks that I remember three years ago they they brought up 11 trailer trucks um, from New Jersey FEMA didn't and staged them inside the gates of Westover with with all kinds of supplies they were that sure that we were going to get hit um, and to be ready for this mm -hmm. uh, so they, they have their own divisions and and you know they they have a lot of secrets also mm -hmm. um, but what, what they're going to do is they're actually going <laughs> to going to offload, okay, these commodities. And we have little tents to cover them in case it rains. And when they're going to practice, and we're, we're, the ideal site will be large. It'll be a, a horseshoe-shaped area. And we're going to need a lot of volunteers, okay, not only to drive vehicles, personal automobiles, uh, but also to load vehicles. And, and the idea of this is going to be your, let's use Southwood, your town has been impacted, okay? So we're going to hypothetically use the high school and the track and we're going to have 75 to 80 cars drive in. The driver is going to stay behind the wheel. Okay. You're going to be signaled in. You're going to make your first stop at the water depot. Your trunk pops open. There's going to be two people loading two and three cases of water in your car. You're going to move up another 10 to 20 feet. They're going to load some blankets in your car. You're going to roll up another 10 to 20 feet. And you're going to have um, the MRE thrown in your trunk. Your trunk's going to be slammed closed for you. There will be a police officer sending you out of the exit. They're going to do this to see how many people they can actually move through in a day, in an hour, and per minute. They're going to actually break it down to in the event that there is a real disaster and people need water, MREs and blankets to keep warm, so on and so forth. Um, we did it about 18 months ago um, up at UMass on a trial, and we probably had 100 cars that we used, and we'd circulate them two or three times through. We'd unload them for the people and stuff. But it is amazing how many hundreds of people, if everybody cooperates, that you can do 
within an hour's time. Um, I think we did about 240 people in the first 40 minutes. Everybody had to get in the rhythm of what's going on. And, yes. You know, are you going to load the water? Am I going to load the water? How are we going to rotate people around? But it's amazing. And once people get it, you can move people through quickly. And depending on how long the emergency would last, I would think water they'd come for maybe on a daily basis, the MREs. After one of those, you probably wouldn't be bad. But I mean, uh, <laughs> you. Uh, I know. Yeah, it's just, boy, I tell you. That's all you have. Danny Mariotti gave me those one time. Yeah, it's. it's it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's better no. than starving. That it's better than starving to death, but I gotta take some. I'll take spam over on MRE. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oof, no, really. If you don't have spam, you'll eat an MRE, right? Yeah. <laughs> Some people will, they have. Yeah. What's the lifespan of spam in a can? Hmm? Forever. Is it? Yeah, and the MREs are about seven and a half years, so you can you can see there's no preservatives in those, right? Oh, Jesus. It's all salt. But anyway, uh, so, so it is worthwhile, and, and my thought would be, um, we probably would, would, as I'm kind of looking at my section, we would take like a Southwick, uh, a Tolland, uh, a Granville, and, and Aguam, West Springfield would probably go to the Big E, and I'm thinking if you're in Southwick, would you drive to West Springfield? to get water, I mean, if you had none, would you do it? Um, and then how many people can we service there? Because we'll have a portion of Springfield, we'll have West Springfield and Aguam going to the Big E, which would be, is the ultimate you know, regional center because that thing is miles. It's 155 acres of land that you can actually drive Well, if, drive the, through. if the roads are open and the bridges are yeah, that's, mm -hmm. the, fuel is the, the infrastructure yeah. and mm -hmm. fuel, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's yeah. a lot of fuel to just go get us some yeah. water. Yeah. The question is, is we have well water here, we have pumps, we have uh, generators. Yeah, I'm sticking to but, but the thing is, but we don't have a bunch of empty these yeah, per se, so what would be people be bringing into a point of you know, distribution or dispensary of water if we and set up a water station? And how many people would be able to wait to You know, like a guard, set up a couple of garden hoses mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, but how many people? Or maybe the fire department's quicker hoses. Mm -hmm. They have a tanker. Don't drink that water. <laughs> yeah, that's a thought too. But seniors aren't going to be able to, you know, buffaloes, but get anywhere. Yeah, but that's not where good. Are you gonna, Is yeah. it sterilized water? Your National Guard has had buffaloes for potable, non-potable drinking water and stuff, but I, the simple way out of it is right, is right there where Carl's holding, and stuff. So my thought would be three towns, uh, Westfield, um, would probably be a standalone because they're 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 forty five thousand forty thousand people, uh, and that's what that's the plan we're we're working on now. So um, I don't think Granville or Tallinn have anything comparable to to what you have as a, as a community um, as far as resources. So I would think that the regional school would probably be the, um, uh, uh, the, the location. The, yeah, the location. And so Is this on a weekday during school? <laughs> well, I can't tell you when there's going to be a disaster, <laughs> but let me say this. If, if, well, this if it's if a real one, well, let's, right. let's put, yeah, let's put it this way: if if a disaster hits this community or this region of that magnitude, let's hope there's a school still standing. There won't be any school in session. I'll tell you that. Yeah. When, yeah. They, when they just had this gas thing in Lawrence and those yeah. places, how long were those schools out? How long were they canceled? Oh, a week, at least a week. And I don't know how many. Because be, some of them the became shelters. Yeah. Okay, and how many of them are still open now, or if they, were they rerouting the kids? Uh, my next turn down there is November second, so I'll get a real bird's eye view to see. Oh, you guys are rotating, yeah, still. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and both of our EOCs are still down there as command posts, besides some of the hardened facilities that they have. So, yeah. It's, so Framingham's still open. Then. Oh yeah, but but you know, we're we're thin. I mean, this is a this is an incident of gigantic magnitude. Mm -hmm. Uh, nothing like we've ever... Well, yeah, because you're a civilian. And you're not set up for long-term stuff like the military mm. would be. The military yeah. would have the, the people, FEMA, the staffing, yeah. the training. And, and, and FEMA has been great. And, uh, but
but it's just an unfortunate event that mm -hmm. a lot of innocent people mm -hmm. have became Famous victims spread of. Kind yeah. of sin. Huh? Famous spread kind of thin, right? Well, yeah, but there's the a lot of stuff going on, uh, and you know, they're still working to St. Thomas and the, the Puerto Rico, and there's there's disasters now happening in Texas with flooding and so Florida, and so they're up, still cleaning up that. Mess Florida, Florida is still being cleaned up and stuff. So, yeah, it's busy. It's it's a busy time. What what are you looking at for time timeline next summer, next spring? When you when when they're looking at putting this together? Well, we should start to think about what what locations we want to use, maybe what resources we're going to need, and if they do pick this area, who can we get for volunteers? I mean, what I'm telling you, they want everybody in this room, hypothetically, to be in an automobile, mm -hmm. to be in line, and maybe the CERT team people, and maybe some, some senior citizens who have retired that want to volunteer a half a day just to run a car through. Sure. And, and, and do you have to get the stuff back? <laughs> well, if you want the MREs, you'll probably... You know, oh, no, the pillows, the blankets, <laughs> and the water. I mean, so does, does, the, right does the FEMA trailer have to be reloaded and it drives on to its next drill? I would say, I, you would know, be. you want to know something? Yeah. Honestly, okay, I would say they'll probably let you keep the stuff. You know why? Because you can't reuse it. I mean, you Right, can't because by the time you load it up, how cost yeah. efficient is it? You have to palletize it, it right. again. Because yeah. right. these things will come off on pallets. Hmm. When, we, when we drilled... At UMass, uh, luckily they had a forklift. Okay, so we'll probably be looking to your DPW for forklift to start to unload. I mean, it's a trailer truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, a forklift, but it lifts on uh, a loader. Yeah. 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 yeah, your loader has some. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And um, so, yeah, it could be. Uh, an honest, it was a pain in the neck. Well, nobody wants to keep the MREs. You know, maybe there might be a few people in town that wants to. TJ. The survivors. <laughs> TJ, yeah. He, yeah, he doesn't have any dinner. money to buy a meal. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the DPW might might be a place with the parking facilities that they have and the horseshoe. One so way in and one that, way out. Or the schools also looping around the high school. That's what he was thinking, yeah. yeah. And you can, blow, you can yeah. line cars all around the there. Yeah. The school has such a long driveway for yeah. queuing cars. The yeah. DPW would, would, doesn't loan itself mm -hmm. to that. Plus, you'd never want to. You'd never want to take that. That would take it out of play from doing all its other functions. Mm -hmm. So, well, Angie, be dumping onto ten and two hundred two. You don't want to do right. That. You don't want right. You don't want queue any cars queuing up there. People so, already don't know how to use the center lane. Exactly, right. that is correct. Um, so, actually, during the course of the morning, one, once we got a rhythm into it and stuff like that, uh, it actually became fun. It actually was say, you know, this can really work, and and. Uh, well, we people used to do work. household hazardous waste drills like that. Yeah. You drive up, people in the Tyvek suits, every, mm -hmm. everybody knows it. It's a great drill, right, Tom? You've done enough of those over the years. years. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, stay in your car, to your hood, we'll take the stuff out, you know. Trump and well, then you take the stuff out, the put the stuff in. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it should be well, interesting. And, and once you folks Firm decide life. we meet in January again, yeah. Um, you want to come to that meeting? <clears throat> if I'm alive and well, I certainly will be. <laughs> All right. And um, well, if you can't make it, send Patrick. Uh, Patrick is no longer with us. He's with the governor. I, that's okay. And he, he, he's fill in by Jan by January, he's going to make his mind up. I I think that um, my own personal opinion. Uh, I think he's he's on his way to better and bigger things. Okay. Uh, don't forget, he, this is his is third Ill? time is going Ill? through this drill. We're talking about uh, my boss. The governor's uh, Western Patrick Mass Rep Carnavali, used to be the MEMA director. He was the MEMA regional director here. And um, he he's from Pittsfield. And um, he used to work uh, up in Pittsfield and, um, when Governor Slucci uh, was, was the sitting governor. Uh, the name of the place was called Hillcrest, um, a center for troubled children up in the Berkshires, and, and Pat was one of the managers up there, and and Salucci was on a Goodwill tour, just visiting it, and obviously they spell their name the, the same way, and uh, they <laughs> <laughs> they became automatic Italian buddies and stuff, and. Uh, uh, the governor took a liking to Pat, and if you know Pat, he's, he's a, he's a likable character. 
and um, called him up one day and said, I, I, need, I need a chief of staff in the Springfield area. Uh, I want you to report in two weeks. That's says no. Two days later, state police were up there, paid him a visit, and they said, the governor wants to see you down in Boston. I understand you're not interested in the job, they told him, <coughs> take a trip down. So two weeks later, he was opening up the Springfield office working for, for Salucci. And then when Salucci became the ambassador to Canada, uh, Jane Swift, who was the lieutenant governor, uh, became governor. And um, I think Pat and Jane Swift uh, were high school friends, believe it or not, and, and became very personal friends. And uh, he stayed on to work for her. And then when she decided she was no longer going to be governor, obviously Mitt Romney. Came Mitt made that decision. Well, for her. Mitt made that decision for a lot of people, and uh, um, she just didn't have twenty million dollars to fund her own campaign with, so um, she didn't run. Um, and that's when Pat uh, uh, was appointed here to meet him. That was God. That was twelve years ago, if you can believe it or not. Yeah. So. Um, so now uh, Governor Baker um, um, asked Pat to come back and, and do the same thing again, um, and, and rightfully so. Pat knew the job. Pat's done a good job since he's been there, and um, I'm sure um, he will be rewarded for you know for the efforts that he's put forward to. And and guess what? It can only help us in this region because now. Besides saying, gee, was somebody local has done it, we now really have a stronger voice here too, and um, so it'll it'll help us it'll help us all out. So, and and he deserves it. He's a good guy. Good guy. Um, uh, never thought he was better than anybody. He was he was just a regular guy, and uh, so um, good things are uh, good people get rewarded for doing a good job, I guess. Um, so let's move on to the last thing, and then I'll shut up. And that will be uh, earlier in the spring. We started. <clears throat> we have a book that's called a comprehensive emergency management plan. Each town has one. There are 351 copies floating around the Commonwealth somewhere. Um, at one time, we used to actually come and visit every third year, uh, and I was the bearer of that. Uh, update for a good portion of my first six or seven years here. Those are um, digital now, right? They're digital. And now it's, it's turned all electronic, has, yeah. has become far more sophisticated, um, and there are many more things that you can do with it, and um, it's, it's more or less going to be used, uh, not only as each and every town must have one, you can start to put stuff and load stuff in there as it pertains to your community because being electronic you're going to be the person who once we get it all done on paper and sketched out and stuff you're going to be the person who could be able to load that information in there and keep it more confidential and put in exactly what you want that's going to serve your communities so it's, it's going to be a, a living document, it's going to be an ongoing document, and um, I think it's going to be a, a very worthwhile and advantageous to you. But with that responsibility that was always put on the emergency manager, and, and you know, I, I at one time had all 101 cities and towns in, in, the, in the four western counties. Um, at the end of each cycle, each fourth year cycle, um, I was put away for a couple of weeks for mental rehabilitation before they put me back into the field <laughs> because I got to tell you something. It is, it's just, it's, it's overbearing. It's too much. Uh, oh, it is just, you know, I, I used to be able to tell you where every EOC was, what color the wallpaper or paint was in each one for 101 cities and towns. And, um, and after a while, after the second to third visit with that EMD, you had a fear for your life that he wasn't going to kill you for trying to drag this information out of him. And, and, and secondly, um, 
you knew that some of the information was now a question of lip service, you know, mm -hmm. let's get this little weasel out of here so we can get on with our lives. And, and that's not good, okay? There were some people that were so dedicated to it. And uh, there were some other people that just didn't really care. Uh, so maybe by going to this new approach, we're going to get that information that we really need. So it's going to involve police to do a portion of their job. It's going to involve fire. It's going to involve EMS. It's going to involve public health. Um, it's going to involve... Well, that's the, we just did the update a while ago, child. Yeah. And that's what we... And, and that, to everybody. Everybody yeah. gave their input. Okay. And, and as you go into it, you want to start to take a look at it. And one of the things that that some of the cities and towns are now looking into is, number one, DPW. Do you, in your DPW, do you have a list of every vehicle that's in your department? Do you have the registration? Do you have the serial number? Do you have the weight? Do you have the capacity for each one of those vehicles? So you can have that on file electronically whether DPW director leaves to go to a bigger city, he retires, somebody inherently has to have that information because that's the kind of world that we are now living in. Okay. Secondly, you have another responsibility because you're one of the 101 cities and towns within the western region <clears throat> that are part of the mutual aid compact that if you need something, you're going to get something from another city or town, okay? If they need something, they're going to ask you for it. And we he better, does that now. Huh? He, he oh. talks to other cities and towns, DPWs, and they help well, each other out now. Yeah, the absolutely. The town yeah. fire. Yes. Right. An example. Yeah, exactly. So we want, you want to know what you have, you know, what equipment you have. Well, I know that comes into play sometimes, too, when you're saying... What operator was on this piece of equipment? What was the piece of equipment? Because that's part of the FEMA reimbursement formulas. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So you want to always what right. types of DPW okay. equipment you and, might and use now for one, fire trucks. Right. And, and now one of the other things they want to know is some of the inventories that you have, and you should know this for yourself. You know, do we so, have portable so. generators in our in our DPW or in our town or in our school buildings? You know, and now they're going so sophisticated that if you make a request for us and you have a disaster, they want to know what the KW is, what the make and model is, is it a, is it a one phase, two phase, three phase, or four phase mm -hmm. generator. So in the days of, hey, I need some help here, what do you need? I need a generator. Okay, let's see what we can do for you. Now all of a sudden say, wait a minute, there's a thousand different type of generators. Is it gasoline? Is it propane? Is it diesel? What is it? And these things continue to get more and more uh, uh, sophisticated as we go along. Um, I know one police department that used to keep track of the ammunition that they had. Wow. You know, how many shotguns do we have? How many riot guns do we have? How many clubs do we have? How many shields do we have? How many helmets do we have? How many ballistic vests do we, we now? We still do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, that, yeah. and I know some of that information is, is confidential information, but somewhere, somehow, it's got to be shared. And, and, and with this confidentially, with the, e, with the, with the EOC um, uh, EMP, uh, uh, some booklet electronically, um, a lot of that information can be placed right at, at, at your fingertips. So, it's not a guess anymore. Hang on a second. Bingo, I got it. And public health. You know, how many how many shots do you give residents? How many flu shots? Um, what do you have for inventory on on X, Y, and Z in your town? And and for Charlie, what what are the sheltering capabilities in your community? What do you have here on hand for blankets and for cots and, and, and so on and so forth? Um, so that's something, I don't know how extensive you've gone with it. I think it's something to, to think about, and maybe in January we can come up with some type of formulation or a form 
you know, well, like don't a you, bunch. Don't you have a standardized, we have, we have a standardized, standardized one. electronic template we where have, everybody gets a thumb drive and yeah. then, okay, here's your pot and you fill it out. Except that it's, again, it becomes generic. Okay. Yeah. How? Oh, but you can have drill down screens within that. You, right. It's generic on the exactly. top few right. data fields and then you can customize yep. it below. And that's, that's my point. Uh, you know, where do you want to go with it for your community? Okay. Okay. And uh, and it does it because guess what in five years we will change this table around again as we have since we started this fifteen or sixteen years ago and you don't want that next group of people to start to have to reinvent the wheel you want to say here's what we have you know <coughs> try to and I think the most important thing is is to keep it updated mm -hmm. and and um, uh, know where we are at all times, okay? So, um, just a thought, um, and, and it does, to do it right, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. But I think once you finish with that, you, you certainly can um, uh, have a real handle on <coughs> where, your, you, where your community is. And the other, the other thing they, they do ask that I think a lot of communities go ahead and, and ignore. There's one uh, uh, that they talk about um, where uh, they're called venues in your community. It's where people meet, people gather, um, and uh, where you have events in your town. Your high school might be the biggest one in this town. Murphy's, I don't know. Donut, huh? Murphy's Donuts. No, well, that's one too. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. Mm -hmm. and, you know, on, a, on a weekend, you get a lot of people there. Mm -hmm. um, but do you have a outside of the high school? Do you have a park, a regular okay. park? You know, that would be a venue that could be listed on, under as a possible terrorist attack. And and um, they they talk about them. Some people laugh, but there are in the Commonwealth, and I, and I will tell you something right now. Um, especially in Berkshire County, where people call it New York State or, or the Hills or the Hicks or something. Well, they got Tangle with no those Oh, houses. Tangle. you got the world's most famous violinist who lives 40 miles from here, okay? You've got one of the, one of the world's most famous singers, uh, uh, folk singers, who lives 40 miles from here. We're James Taylor, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the uh, cello is the Yo-Yo Ma. Um, uh, movie stars, um, Richard Chamberlain, the, the famous actor, lives here. Uh, there, there are there are so many famous people. We've Dennis Clark in town. Uh, of course, boy. right. Him and Tommy, they're they're, they're regulars right. at their, all the rock groups. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Twin brother of Dick Clark from American Bandstand, right? And uh, so yeah. The Norris, there's all the department heads playing instruments. <laughs> so. Um, so yeah, the, the the venue part of it becomes becomes very important, and um, finding that location, and uh, and there are believe me, in in several cities and towns in in Western Mass, some of the world's most famous people, and it, we laugh, and it's in Massachusetts, and. Uh, so Bill Cosby, he's from the... We already killed him. Oh, he's not there anymore. Yeah. 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 Well, we he got Bill, moved. Bill Cosby? Yes, we did. That was over but Dennis has been killed three times, so Dennis is still winning. That was over at the old DPW. Oh, was he over there? Well, we had a hel he was in a helicopter crash on Sodom, uh, Drake Mountain. <laughs> oh, uh, behind me, huh? Yeah. Yep, yeah. helicopter crash. Was he was on en route from his home to Bradley Field. Bruce, are you done? I am, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Bruce? Okay. So we'll go on to the next part: um, transportation and storage of needles and sharp units. I know uh, Charlie and I and Tommy were going back and forth with maybe a discussion on that, and then Tommy, you weren't sure if maybe the. Um, if Richard had anything to add to that, or maybe the police and how they deal with these issues for their respective departments, you know. Uh, we currently don't accept sharps, like with the medication drop off. Yep. 
Yeah. We had one of our officers put his hand in one of the bags, and there was some sharps in there. Mm -hmm. I just think you're aware of that. Yeah. And um, we do have some containers that, if we have to, we can dispose of them, put them in a proper container. But I believe we're referring them to the fire yeah. department for sure. Okay. Right. So the program is such that any resident has access to it. So they can come in and they can acquire the actual legitimate sharps container, uh, which we provide for your cost, and then they can fill it up and bring it back to us, and it's kind of our, our, our exchange program. So if you have people that are diabetics, we have uh, a lot of people that are diabetics using insulin needles and things like that. Um, that seems to be the biggest volume of exchange. Um, once in a while, we get somebody that might be you know, home at, from, from the hospital with an illness, they, they're not quite sure, so we try to give them some information and things like that. Um, our biggest problem with the program is that we also can't take medications. So anything dry form, bottle form, can, you know, that's in a medication tablet stop or uh, a blister pack can be disposed of the police department. Anything that's a, a liquid form can't be. So where we have a problem is patients that are in hospice that are prescribed medications like morphine and things like that in a liquid form. And we have no way to get rid of that. And neither does the Department of Health or anything else. We typically will refer them back to the issuing agency. So if the hospital gave them the medication, they're supposed to bring it back to the hospital. If their doctor prescribed it and they got it at CVS, they can either bring it back to their doctor or the doctor can say, no, please bring it back to the pharmacy. And that's one way we deal with it. Honestly, what happens after that, I don't know. I don't know if people just go and throw it out the window because they don't feel like going to CVS or what. I don't know. It's, you know most people are very concerned about this because they know publicly that it is, that it is a concern, a health concern. Um, and the health concern is actually on the medication stuff is far greater than you'd expect because the filtration systems don't filter out the medications. They pass right through. So if we're filtering and discharging to the Connecticut River, let's say, those medications go right into the Connecticut River and are very destructive to wildlife. And so that's part of why the collection process is so good. So we always try to preach, you know, if you have those medications when somebody dies or stuff you're no longer using, go to the police department, get rid of that. But it's always, well, what do I do with the liquid forms? So we do run into a problem with that. That's not to say that once in a while somebody doesn't put a couple in their sharps container and we don't see them. That happens. So once we collect it, we have a monthly pickup from a company called Stary Cycle, and their business is sharps containers and hazardous materials. Where we run into problems um, on the ambulance side is that sometimes we have a, a commingling of product. So the sharps containers are supposed to be specifically the sharps. It's supposed to be actually only the needle part, but we don't require them to break the needle part off and put it in the container, so they just take the whole syringe and put it in there. And Stericycle's okay with that. They then incinerate all the material. They do sort the stuff because they also have a lot of offenders that try to get rid of stuff that's not supposed to be disposed of. So the hospitals and things like that have to label all of theirs. Ours is labeled at the fire department and inventoried. And they pick up not only the town collected stuff, which is on the second floor of the fire department, but also the uh, ambulance exchange. So the ambulance exchange we can also get rid of at the hospital. So if we have a container that's full, we can leave it there. Or if we have other hazardous material waste, which could be um, any soiled gauze and, and clothing and things like that, we can get rid of it at the hospital. Um, the cycle typically is sharps only for our, our department. Um, costs basically, uh, we can get 32 of the containers that we swap out for about $80. We go through anywhere from 100 to 150 of those annually. We are a don't ask, don't tell type of community. If you say you're from Southwick and you want to sign off and say you're from, you know, whatever street, just sign and go, here, here you go, we take them. We don't ask for IDs or anything like that because it's just an exchange program. Um, and so the department covers, the fire department covers the cost of all the uh, stericycle reclamation and of the exchange for the, for the containers. It's not an awful lot. It, uh, we're paying about $98 a month for Stericycle to pick up the waste. They leave new containers, package it all up for us and everything else. It's a real easy, simple process. So we plan on seeing their, their truck once a month. They take everything with them. We haven't had any problems. Were they to go through and audit our trash and find something, we would then be ultimately responsible. But if it's only one or two items that are commingled with the trash, they're not going to make a big deal about it. It's when they open that bag from the, you know, the, the hospital and they find all kinds of things in there they were supposed to get rid of, then there's fines imposed and they'll probably stop doing business with them and things like that. So for us, it's a very successful program. One of the areas we do get into pre troubles with is other than hazardous materials. We had a, a delivery of mercury to the police department a couple of weeks ago, um, unexpectedly. 
and not quite sure, you know, the resident wasn't sure how to handle it, so I'm just going to leave this here. And so we ended up using the company Westfield, um, which will take home household hazardous materials, including oil-based paints, latex paints, things like that. We made arrangements to do just to deliver the mercury to them. It was in a container, it was fine. They didn't charge us for it, it was a very small amount. Well, of course, that opens up the door for the next person who says, hey, I heard you guys took some mercury, I have some in my house. Well, no, no, no. And this actually happened last weekend. So I advised the staff, I said, just tell them to contain it and bring it and deliver it on their own to the place in Westfield. There's probably a fee associated with it. I don't know what the fee is, but if we're, that's actually a very good uh, luxury to have. Mm -hmm. So close right. and, and somebody that does accept things it. like that. Yeah, I've brought stuff it, it's really kind of a, yeah. like, super convenient because you're not going to find many communities with something like that. We're still going to get like the last time where that, you know, we'll just call that mercury was abandoned by the resident. That's going to happen. On the landfill side, when people bring their hazardous materials down there, we have no idea what they're putting in the no. containers, none. And a lot of it goes undetected. Uh, I know that you have spoken about the radiological materials and things like that. We're still mm -hmm. working on the metering for that, and that's definitely a concern. Um, but I can tell you numerous examples of fire departments reporting to the DPW landfill area for the purple smoke. And we have no idea what it is, but it just becomes a hazardous mitigation. When I was at the town of Longmeadow, we ended up with a seven-day mitigation there for somebody that used to work at Diamond Matchworks Research and Development, and they did a lot of uh, homework, we'll say, with unlabeled containers, and they ended up having to put a bomb-proof barriers around the house. They evacuated the neighborhood for three city blocks and all this. So these things can get pretty uh, big very, very fast. Um, so we best thing to do is have an opportunity for people to get rid of this stuff. Let them know. So it's education. You can bring it here. There's a place in Westfield that will accept your stuff. Does the town, because I'm, again, new to the town, do they do a uh, household hazardous waste collection? We, we did. did. Yeah, you did. We, we did for several years. Many yeah. years. Yeah. Two decades. And I just want to correct you on one thing. that Latex paint is not considered hazardous. It's dried out, opened up. It's, that's not hazardous. Okay. Um, Oil-based is, though. It's yeah. common. People, a lot of people don't realize that. But um, we did for many years. The, the select board and board of health uh, ran it. Households have such waste behind here. Mm -hmm. And it worked out very well, but it was expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, it was free to the uh, residents, but unfortunately, it's not free to the town. So when this facility opened up that was down in Sturbridge, they put it in that mainline drive, I think, a mainline drive in Westfield. That's right on East Main Street. Now. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. It backs it made, right it up against sense. the with Stiles team. Eyeglass place. Oh, okay. It made sense just to, to uh, use them. They gave a bulk rate. At least they would have some options early on. Yeah. In, in our, tra town. Our, our transfer station, the regs refer people to okay. that Okay. We have a program, too, where the town will pay for the first $20 of each resident yeah. per year. Yeah, they get a discount. Yeah. Per year. Yeah. yeah. So okay. if they have anything, let them know. It may okay. not cost them anything if they bring it over there. Yeah. And that's actually kind of picked yeah. up in, in lieu of the uh, household yeah, hazards yeah. collection. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we yeah. So that's what we kind of does it have to be an identified item? They're, they have a list of hazardous yeah. materials. It's class A, B, C, yeah. and each has a different cost. So okay. you go on their website, they'll identify But if it's it. just in a glass mason jar and we don't know what it is, will they take it? Because that's uh, what we get a lot. They have their discretion whether they want to take it. sure what that is. Yeah. And so that's why yeah. yeah. it ends up being, you know, it goes to the next level where the hazardous materials team in Massachusetts yeah. gets involved. Yeah. But that's where we start. That's our first phone call is hazmat. And they'll send out a technician. I think the last thing they want to do is get something they don't know about on East Main Street. Right. That did shut down the city True. of Westfield. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, near the river, too. Right, right. right near the river. Mm -hmm. Sewage treatment plant, all the shopping exactly. malls, yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. And actually, yeah. just uh, historically, the Board of Health used to collect the needles. Mm -hmm. Charps, and then when Russ came on board, he said, "You know what? We, we're we're using those a lot anyway, so uh, we'll we'll take over that program." Mm -hmm. So we actually, the Board of Health did that, and, and historically, we also took medication. Um, we also and we also had a uh, drug take back day mm -hmm. every day. Matter of fact, I was doing the drug drug take back day the day of the Snowtober storm. Was it 2011? Hmm. Uh, and at DPW, you were doing right, weren't you doing it? Yes, absolutely. It so we did that also, but. What, what it turned out that we could uh, get a grant to put the, the kiosk at the, mm -hmm. at the police station. Yeah. So we were involved in that early on, then we moved it there to make it sense. We still have a problem with the liquid, though, and yeah. we're still trying to deal with that. That's the one thing we so, have an issue with right it's now. Tough. It is. It really is. Because, you know, unfortunately, most of the narcotics are in a liquid form, right. the higher potencies type mm -hmm. of things. There are tablet yeah. forms, but those are the hardest ones to get rid of. And that's yeah. typically what we do see is in the form of uh, the liquids. So It's a program that's working. 
we haven't had any exposures or anything like that. A resident can still use any sealed container. So if they have a laundry a jug that's empty, they can rinse that out or not even rinse it, I don't care. Put their stuff in there. As long as it's got a sealed lid on it and they write on it sharps, we can dispose of it that way as well too. So people are not sure what to do, how to get rid of it. So I always tell them, just that sealed container and then we'll give you the right box to use. But it definitely is, it, 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 it helps with the public. It's not preventing any you know, public health disasters, I don't think, but it certainly is a convenience. The other problem we do get into from time to time is you know, disposed needles that are just on the road, roadside. Mm -hmm. You know, what do I do with this? Okay, you get a glove on that and I'll take it for you. Because all the PDs are typically the first ones to get the report of that. Mm -hmm. So how have you guys been handling it? I don't know how you did it uh, Randy, but... You have the single sharps. The single one, yeah. yeah. Is that the scoop and lock one? Yeah. Yeah. So you can just scoop it up and there's a little cap twist mm -hmm. right on it and get rid of it that way. We had a couple of those in Granby as well, too. Um, we had a, a huge uh, heroin problem at the Cumberland Farms, apparently. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know why, but it was like where everybody went to use drugs. And so the needles would wind up all over the place. Like yeah, the outside afterwards, and just it was crazy. Um, but the police finally got that single container for scoop and, and lock. And, so who should somebody call if they see needles on the side? Yeah, yeah. That'd yeah. be the police or the fire? The police will respond to that, um, typically, at first. Police? Um, yeah, but then we'll take it from them. We we'll just put it right in the truck container that we have. Now, have we, have we had any of those at the transfer station, Randy, or, or public parks? Yeah. As far as needles? Yeah. yeah. No, not collection. We have stray calls for stuff like that. You know, before we had the Sharps containers, you know, you would stop at a Dunkin' Donuts and grab a cup with a lid and, until you got to the proper container. But, I mean, every so often you get a call for that. So, like I said, easy program, does work, very convenient, and more and more people are, are aware of it too. Tommy, anything you want to add from the Board of Health on that subject matter? Or? No, just I'm going to follow up on that, the liquid, see where the, the, st the state is with that, and see if there's any uh, resources we can utilize to, to <clears throat> augment what we already have for the solids. Johnny, what do you guys do at the hospital when you collect liquids? We have a company that comes in and takes that stuff pretty much on a regular basis. I know we had a trouble with uh, us being overweight on the... Uh, Solid form of the wrappers, like the, like the nicotine stuff, psyche. We only can support so much, and then we get charged enormous amounts of money. So we try and keep that under wraps. So I don't really know all that much about it, but we have company come in, and you know, it's tight with the weight. Well, if there's any advice or help you can give Tommy on that and his research, that'd be appreciated. Yeah, and vice versa. I'll ask about the yeah. liquid stuff, see, we'll see how yep. they do that there at the hospital. All right. Okay, thanks. Old business, anybody here have anything under old business? New business. Anybody have anything under new business? I'll just point out the MVP program. We had that uh, um, workshop maybe three weeks ago. I want to thank all of you. A lot of you showed up for that. I'm waiting for the final report from our consultant. I should get that in the next week or two. And then once I get that, I'll talk to Carl and we'll schedule a, a listening session with the select board. So I'll let you know when that happens. But yeah. likely sometime mid-November is what I'm, I'm thinking right now. It's a very educational program to sleep through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good. And good working groups. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, that's all we have here. So our next meeting is going to be January 24th, 2019, back here. And I think Bruce is going to be coming forward with some information for Charlie, myself, and uh, Cindy Sullivan for the, um, the makeup of the agenda at that point in time. So having noted that, the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion Second. made by Tommy. Second by Charlie. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you for coming. You. See you next year. What time is it? See you, Donnie. See you, Lord of Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Karen. Bye, Karen. Did you yeah. I've emailed that off. No, we adjourned at uh, 1040.